All right, guys. So this is the first uh, video lesson. I'm not sure how it will go. We'll have to just see. So I will be reading off of the slides and I'll try and take you guys through the slides and sort of say, OK, on slide two, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'll also be looking at the, the notebook. So that's this book. Um, and again, I'll, when I use it, I will mention I'm on page two, whatever, whatever. Uh, I hope you're all well. Um, I hope you're keeping safe, washing your hands, social distancing, all of that stuff. Do take it seriously. It's very, um, you know, it's an important time to do it. Uh, before I continue, I'm going to show you guys something. How cool is this? You might either find this really gross or very cool, depending on who you are. Um, this is a, a decorated Tibetan monkey skull that my dad got me for uh, for Christmas because he knows I'm a, a weirdo. Um, and yeah, I just thought it was really cool and worth showing you guys. So there you go. OK, on that note, let's start. So um, we're talking about eliminative materialism. And before we start, we're just going to quickly go over some stuff. Because uh, I think this is a useful way of putting this. Um, and I hope, I hope, guys, that this uh, video lesson is useful for you. So to start us off, we've looked at three physicalist theories, right? We've looked at functionalism. We've looked at, uh, Christ, look at my brain. We've looked at functionalism. We've looked at behaviorism. And we've looked at identity theory. And all of those different physicalist theories, and they're called physicalist theories, remember, because they think that we can describe the mind through physical processes alone, right? That we don't need to appeal to dualism. We don't need to appeal to idealism. We can just look at physical material stuff, the brain. Um, so what we've seen is that with all three of these theories, what they've done is said we can reduce mental states to X, Y or Z. Right. For the behaviorist, they thought we can reduce mental states to behavioral states. The functionalist said we can reduce mental states to functional roles. And finally, with the behavior, with the um, identity theory, sorry, they said we can reduce mental states to brain states. Right. And that was the physicalist model, as we've seen so far. We can reduce mental states to X, Y or Z physicalist states. Well, the eliminativists agree with that on the main, right? They are also physicalist theory. They are also a physicalist theory. But what the, their formula is slightly more complicated because they are not saying we can reduce mental states to X, Y or Z. And part of the reason they're called eliminativists is because they do not think that that reduction will be possible. So let's turn to um, slide two and I'm going to read this quote. Eliminative materialism is the thesis that our common sense conception of psychological phenomena constitutes a radically false theory, a theory so fundamentally defective that both the principles and the ontology of that theory will eventually be displaced rather than smoothly reduced by completed neuroscience. So we're going to take it through real, real quickly. So. The thesis that our common sense conception of psychological phenomena constitutes a radically false theory, a theory so fundamentally defective that both the principles and the ontology of that theory will eventually be displaced rather than smoothly reduced by completed neuroscience. Right, this is Paul Churchland. And what he's trying to say, right, is that the, the psychological phenomena, the mental states that we've talked about, are so wrong, our understanding of them are so wrong that they are simply not going to be able to be reduced. Right? So if we think about functionalism, for example, they're saying our mental states can be reduced to functional roles. This is different. Right? This is saying this can't really be reduced, that they're actually so wrong. Our own beliefs about these things are so incorrect that they're not going to be able to be reduced. And they're going to instead have to be simply replaced by something that's correct. We'll get into that in, in more detail later, but let's just look real quick at where it says both the principles and the ontology of the theory will eventually be displaced. Right. If we remember ontology being the, the idea of existence, right, he's saying that these mental states don't exist. And we'll come back to that in, in more detail later. But a good example might be, for example, um, and his wife, Patricia Churchill, mentions this in a video I'll send you guys. She says that something like will, right, our, our own sense of will, free will, strong will, weak will, etc., doesn't exist, right? If we, if we open up a brain and put it through a, a, a scan, we're not going to find an area in the brain or a, or a chemical in the brain that causes will. It's just not going to be found. So we'll come into that later. So now we're turning to um, slide three, and this is where I think I explain it a bit better. Let me just zoom in slightly because I cannot see the thing. 
See, this is where, uh, this is really weird. I'm, I'm finding it very strange not having someone to talk to. So, eliminative materialism, or simply eliminativism, is skeptical about the chances of all of our folk psychological concepts to be explicable in terms of the brain and neuroscience. So here's the phrase, there will be no smooth reduction of mental states to physical states. Now, as we've already mentioned, this is not because they think the mind is non-physical. Right? This is not because these people are dualists or idealists or any of these things. We know the eliminativists are physicalists. So it's not that they don't think that this will be explained through physical processes, but instead that they, they view our own understanding of mental states as simply not existing. Right, the, the things that we believe exist in the world don't. And it says on this slide, again, this is slide two, to look at 286. So we're going to do that now. So give you guys two seconds to do that. It's really weird imagining you guys being in the classroom with me, but not. Um, yeah. So we're looking at 286, and this is the third paragraph down. So it starts with to understand what this claim amounts to. Uh, and and we're, we're looking at the analogy between um, our understanding of mental states and the Black Plague, right? Or, or the, or, uh, sorry, the Black Death or the Plague. So... When a plague ravaged Europe between 1346 and 1353, people became all too familiar with the disease. They called it the Black Death, and they could accurately identify victims by their symptoms, which many believed were brought on by exposure to what they called at the time bad air. With the advance of germ theory, we are brought... Sorry, guys. With the advance of germ theory, we are now pretty confident the disease was caused by a pathogen, most probably a bacteria, doesn't matter what it's called, and was spread by fleas carried by rats. Germ theory has shown that bad air has nothing to do with the spread of disease. Indeed, we would probably want to say that bad air doesn't really exist. The concept of bad air is part of a way of seeing the world which misrepresents the phenomena of disease so seriously that we have decided it can have no place in a proper account of the Black Death. By explaining the disease in terms of bacterium, we have been able to eliminate, there's that key word, bad air from our vocabulary and from our picture of what exists from our ontology. In the same way, the eliminativist argues that our vocabulary of mental states will be eliminated once we have a more advanced understanding of what makes us tick. Like bad air, our folk psychological concepts present an inaccurate conception of what there is and needs to be eliminated right so, so this comparison between the black death and our understanding of mental states tries to point out that not only was bad air incorrect right and, and didn't fit in the model of reality but actually misrepresented the fact so much so that it stopped us from being able to properly deal with um the, the disease and I guess in the same way, the eliminativists are trying to claim that our view of our mental states is so wrong that we're never really going to get close to answers that we need to find. Um, and we'll come back to this, but they will point out, for example, that um, that psychiatry, for example, uses folk psychology, but still isn't really able to answer many of the questions we still have about our minds. Right. So, for example, um, why do we sleep? Yeah. What are dreams and why are they the way they are? Right. That's a question that's been asked since, you know, who knows when. And I mean, if we think about people like Freud and Jung, they were dealing with this question and we still haven't really progressed since then. Right? We still don't really understand dreams. It's still an, uh, mostly an enigma to us. By the way, I've noticed just now I'm looking at myself in the video and not at you guys, which I think I prefer. But, you know, sorry if, if the eye contact thing bothers you. So we're going into the next slide, which continues to explain this Black Plague analogy. So what is being shown here with, with this analogy is that previously held concepts that were used to explain the plague not only didn't exist, right? Not only did bad air not exist, but it misrepresented the phenomena of disease so seriously that we have decided it can have no uh, place in our ontology, right? In our, in our belief in what exists. Um... Yeah. So, so the eliminativists are similarly arguing that our vocabulary of mental states will be eliminated as it shows more and more that they are incapable of actually explaining what's going on in our minds. 
Um, so th this is a further explanation that this analogy is trying to point out that our common sense talk about the mind makes use of a theory, right? So like the uh, like during the plague, they use the theory of bad air. We are using the theory of folk psychology, right, of our conception of our minds. It is a theoretical framework that we use to predict and interpret human behavior. But the eliminativists are arguing that it is literally false, right? That the theory that we base our understanding of our minds on is just incorrect, right? It's false in the same way as bad air was false. And so our talk about beliefs, sensations, memories, and so on is flawed and misleading as an account of the causes of human behavior, cognition, or the nature of their internal states. Right. So again, this is just to say that we are so unbelievably incorrect about what is materially real in the world in terms of what causes our mental states and what they are in the first place, that they need to be eliminated. Um, we've talked about um, ways in which you guys can try and remember better what these theories are, what they relate to. So we've said functionalism obviously relates to what, what mental states function as, right, their functional roles. Behaviorism is their behavior, right? Mental states can be reduced to behavior. Identity theory was trying to identify brain states and mental states, saying that brains and minds are the same thing. And finally, with, with this one, what, what we're looking at is that they, they're saying that the, the material accounts of the world will need to be such that it eliminates previous ways of looking at the world, namely, in this case, in terms of minds, right, and mental states. Uh, so we are on slide five. I'm just, I don't know if I've mentioned. Um, and we're now looking at 287, page 287. So again, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to get that out. I hope I haven't moved uh, too quickly through this. And guys, please do um, tell me what you think about this video, because it'll be really useful for me for making the next one or Google Hangouts or whatever we do to know how best to do this. Um, so another analogy that we can use to really think about what these guys are doing is, is pointed out in 287. Um, so this is Patricia, Patricia Churchland, who is Paul Churchland's wife, and she's also an, an eliminativist. And she wants to point out um, our conception of heat because um, it was very wrong back in the day. So let's look at this. So this is the quote on 287. It's like the second paragraph down. It is very natural to think of heat as a kind of stuff that moves from hot things to cold things. As natural philosophers investigated the nature of changes in temperature, they gave the name caloric to the stuff that presumably made hot things hot. The caloric fluid theory of heat was eventually rejected because it fits with other parts of science. Ah, oh, this fudging sentence. Sorry, guys. I've done this sentence wrong every single time I've ever read it. So let me try this again. The caloric fluid of heat was eventually rejected because its fit with other parts of science slowly became worse rather than better. And because in the explanatory realm, it was vastly outclassed in explanatory and predictive power by the theory that heat is a matter of molecular motion. Right. So the view was that heat was caused by a thing. Right. And a thing that existed as heat, if you will, as caloric is what they called it. And that explained why the caloric went from a hot thing to a cold thing, causing the cold thing to be hot as well. Right. Well, that was wrong. It was so in it was so unbelievably wrong that it simply needed to be eliminated. And this is what we'll look at this in a second. Yeah, here we go. So this is now the, the next paragraph down and about halfway through. So it says that note that this process. Give you guys two seconds to maybe find that note that this process. Note that this process, right, the process of going from caloric to to molecules. Um, this process is different from a reduction of talk of a caloric fluid to talk of mean kinetic energy. It's a weird sentence, but we'll continue. Rather, talk of caloric has been eliminated because it posits the existence of an entity which does not, in fact, exist. Now, another example of entities that have been eliminated from our current ontology are sound particles as a concept. So it was once thought, it was once thought that sound particles of different sorts occupied different substances and were dispersed into the air when these substances were hit. 
So, for example, a table might contain woody sound particles. And so when struck with a hammer, it emits these particles into the air, which we detect with our ears. Nowadays, it is thought that the sound is actually produced by compression waves in the air. And according to eliminativism, um, once neuroscience has advanced sufficiently, all our folk psychological concepts can be dispensed with. So just as caloric and sound particles have been, just as bad air was, um, these things can be eliminated from our ontology and eliminated from our, from our linguistics, just simply taken away. And so it goes on to say, and this is where we can start to think about what on earth they mean by when they say folk psychological concepts. Hopes, fears, sensations and so on will be shown not really to exist. All there are are different states and processes of the brain, right? So that's um, that's what they're trying to do, right? That That's the eliminativist proposal, is that the things we believe about in terms of our brains and minds are so radically false and so radically using the wrong theory that they simply need to be eliminated, right? Hence the term eliminative materialism. So what am I looking at? Here we go. Um, so so in, in attempting to prove this, if you will, or in attempting to show why this elimination is necessary, what they want to do, um, what they want to do is point out some of the problems with folk psychology. Um, so in defense of their claim, the eliminativists point to the failures of folk psychology to accurately explain much of how we function. So this is what I mentioned not too long ago about the idea that, that we still don't know so much about the mind and the brain, the mind, not, not the brain, the mind, um, which would, for, for the eliminativist, point out that we have a deep, deep problem when it comes to understanding ourselves, that the folk psychological concepts that we've used before don't actually help us explain anything and so must be eliminated. So how we learn things, for example, how memory works, why we sleep, what happiness is, right? We, arguably, as we move further and further in a, in a neuroscientific perspective, we find out properly what these things are rather than vague senses of what these things are. I don't know if I'm making much sense in that, but, um, you know. So these are all questions that are left unanswered through the folk psychological model, right? We simply just don't know yet. And no matter how long we've spent, and we have spent a long time trying to figure these things out, we aren't really any closer to the answers. So it goes on to say, even our psychiatric theories are going to be deeply inadequate as an account of what goes on in mental illness or distress, as they are also deeply entrenched in folk psychological concepts. And so one day, the eliminativists think we will simply eliminate concepts such as paranoia and stress in the way that we did demon possession. Right. They're saying in the same way as we eliminated caloric fluids and bad air, we are going to get rid of these ideas because they don't accurately explain what's going on in the brain or the mind. Um, OK, so this is where we get into some of the sort of issues. Um, and just in terms of tracking where we would be, yeah, just in terms of tracking where we'd be in the book, um, you can look to sort of 288 is where this kind of starts in terms of criticisms and issues. Sorry. Um, so the initial, the initial, the initial issue with the theory is that it, um, it feels intuitively wrong. Right. So so what is um, what is my favorite bird? It's qualia, quail. Sorry. Um, I have a sense introspectively of my own feelings and desires and thoughts and pains, etc. So one of the initial problems with this theory is regards the introspection of my own mental states. Right. They're saying, well, these these uh, conceptions of the mind, these you know memories, desires, thoughts, etc., don't actually exist and that they can be explained through something else. Well, as, as we've been able to find with most of the physicalist theories, one of the initial criticisms or one of the strong criticisms is but what about me? Right. What, where is my conception of my own mental states? If my thoughts and desires don't exist and need to be explained in some other way or eliminated altogether to, to make room for a better explanation, why do I have a sense that they exist? Right? Why do I know my thoughts and desires, etc.? 
So my conviction that I experience such mental states trumps any other considerations. And this is something that Descartes tried to point out. He argued that we cannot reasonably doubt that we are aware of our own contents of our own mind. Um, and in fact, this is this is basically his cogito ergo sum. It, it's to say, OK, I may not know that the physical world exists around me. I may not know that you exist exist as an other mind. I may not know all sorts of things about the world I, in, I apparently inhabit. But what I can know for sure is I think therefore I am. Right. I, I know and it would be insane to say otherwise that I can't know the contents of my own mind because I experience it. Um, so another problem that comes about through eliminativism is the issue of uh, predictive and explanatory power. Now, we've talked about bad air not having explanatory and predictive power for the plague. Right. And therefore, the eliminativists say we need to eliminate it as a concept. I'm going to come back to the plague example because I think we can learn some things from it. But let's look at this slide first. So this is slide nine. So this issue points out the strong predictive and explanatory power of folk psychology. And Paul Churchland admits this. And in fact, I think the quote is on. I've lost it. It doesn't matter. Uh, Paul Churchland admits that it does, in fact, enjoy a substantial amount of explanatory and predictive success. Right. Right. Um, Despite arguing that its problems are so much so that we ought to reject it, he does admit, and we would have to admit, that due to its strength intuitively as a theory, folk psychology actually works quite well as a way to explain and understand human behavior. Um, if we think, for example, put, put it this way, right? And I don't know if this is a great example, but it's an example. So they've mentioned the idea that maybe memory is a bad concept and one that needs to be eliminated. Right. But if I burn my finger today, tomorrow, we would hope I won't burn my finger again because I will know I will have the memory that that happened. And so thus try and not do it. And the claim then could be that there is predictive and explanatory power to why I never burn my finger again, because I have memory of the feeling of burning my finger. I hope that works as an as a example, but I think it begins to point out that actually Whilst this may not have the best explanatory and predictive power, it doesn't have no explanatory and predictive power and has enjoyed some success throughout you know, human life. Also, uh, a problem that the eliminativists have to face is that folk psychology is a universal concept. Right. There, there does not seem to be a culture that has ever existed that does not believe, for example, in desire, thoughts, memories, etc., willpower, all of this stuff. These are things that are deeply, deeply entrenched in the human experience. So much so, it might be argued, and I think very strongly should be argued, that actually it can't be eliminated. Um, sorry, guys, I'm just making sure where I am. Uh, yes, this is now slide 10. This is continuing the thought. Um, also, it could be asked, um, even supposing that we do develop an alternative neuroscientific account or theory of human behavior, uh, would we ever actually give up thinking and talking about uh, our thoughts, feelings and desires? So the example I give in the slide is um, we know and have known for many, 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 many years that the sun, in fact, does not rise and set. Right. It does what it stays exactly as it is. And the, and the earth revolves around it. Um, however, our our linguistic. I was using a fancy word where it was unnecessary. Our our talk of the sun has not changed. Right. Sunset, sunrise is still very much in our vocabulary and still very much in, in our common conception of the way we look at the sun, despite the fact that we know, in fact, that that's not the case. Um. So it says pet toes to page 292. Um, yeah, don't worry. Well, sorry, guys, don't worry about that. Um, so uh, I should restart. But I'm not going to. Um, 
one thing to remember in terms of that, right, in terms of this, this argument for predictive power and explanatory power, is that due to the, the concept of folk psychology, right, and our own conception of our mental states being as entrenched as it is, right, being so um, universal, all of this stuff, we really have to ask questions about its um, evolutionary function. Right, we have to start asking. Well, why has this thing existed for as long as it does? Uh, it has, sorry. Especially if the eliminativists are right that it is defunct and shouldn't be the case. Um, another thing to think about. And this is what I was going to mention earlier. Sorry, I had a total brain fart there. Is that? Let's use the plague example, right? Let's think about bad air again. Um, So bad air was an incorrect conception of how disease works, right? And, and in fact, had to be replaced, as has been argued by the eliminativists, by germ theory. And that the only way we were going to get a hold of the disease is if we understood what actually caused it rather than the thing that we thought caused it. Yeah. But one argument against that is one that comes from a sort of pragma the pragmatic or a pragmatist point of view, right? And, and just in case you don't know the word, pragmatic means sort of practical, right, or useful. So we could make the argument, and I think it's an interesting one, which says, well, you don't have to know germ theory to know. No, let me reword that. Sorry, you don't know. You don't have to know germ theory to know various ways of keeping away from the disease. Right. So let's say your conception of the of the plague was bad air. Right. You believe that it was bad air that was causing the plague. Well, that would probably cause you to stay inside more often and keep away from people who you view as maybe emitting bad air or being a part of bad air or being in bad air. Any of these things. Well, that causes you to stay away from the people who would give you plague. Right. Maybe it causes you to stay inside more often because you're you're comfortable with the air that's in your house and not so comfortable with that which is outside. Well, scientifically, you're incorrect. Right. That is not actually saving you from the plague. Pragmatically, however, it definitely could be argued that despite the fact you have a defunct theory, you can function very, very well with it. Right. And so this, I think, begins to unpack the idea that maybe our conception of our minds is completely incorrect. But as long as it kind of works, fine, fine. You know, and this is a question we have to ask. Is this the most important thing? Is the scientific literacy of our beliefs about our minds the most important thing? It could be, but it could also not. All right. So this is where we, uh, we move on to page 11, page 11, slide 11. Um, and this is the final, uh, final problem that is being pointed out with eliminativism. And this is, again, one that Paul Churchland um, is very freely admitting. And we'll, we'll start with a quote of his, which can be found on page 293. Uh, it's right after it says, eliminative materialism as a theory is self-refuting. Um, so the statement of eliminative materialism is just a meaningless string of marks or noises. Unless that string is the expression of a certain belief and a certain intention to communicate, a knowledge of the grammar of language and so forth. But if the statements of eliminative materialism is true, then there are no such states to express. The statement at issue would just be a meaningless string of marks or noises. It would therefore not be true. Now I'm going to read this one more time and then we're going to look at an example because I think the example, and I did this with Sarah and Sally when you guys weren't here, um, is, is very useful. So the statement of eliminative materialism is just a meaningless string of marks or noises, unless that string is the expression of a certain belief and a certain intention to communicate and a knowledge of the grammar of language and so forth. Right. So this is to say the statement of eliminative materialism, that is that certain things need to be eliminated doesn't hold any meaning unless there are intentions that we have saying it in terms of communicating it. I know that's a really weird way of saying that, but what I'm trying to say is if I don't believe that thoughts, desires, feelings, etc. exist, then when I, as an eliminativist, say eliminativism is yada, 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 the claim would be that there is nothing really being said if thoughts, intentions, etc. don't exist. 
So if the statement of eliminative materialism is true, right, that these things don't exist, then there are no such states to express. Right? Because I don't have intentions, I don't have thoughts, I don't have desires. And so the things that I'm saying with intentions, desires and thoughts don't exist. The statement at issue would then be a meaningless string of marks or noises, and it would therefore not be true. Now, um, one way for us to uh, think about this, and I think it's an interesting one, is to ask ourselves, to remind ourselves, sorry, of the verification principle. Right. So this is the logical positivist. This is the Vienna Circle, all of that. Right. And um, I don't know if you guys sort of remember the verification principle well, but let, let's remind ourselves. The verification principle said that uh, statements or propositions about the world um, cannot be meaningful unless they were one of two things. And obviously no one's in the room, so I can't ask you guys, but they were um, analytical propositions. Is that the word for it? Analytic. I'm right in the word. It doesn't even matter, guys. Sorry. The verification principle says that meaningful propositions about the world have to be either uh, empirically verified. Verified was the word I was looking for. Empirically verified, i.e. noticed in the world, observed in the world, etc. Or analytically verified, i.e. true by themselves, true by definition. It's Hume's fork. You know, we've gone over this a couple of times now. Well. What's the problem with the verification principle? Now, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to think about it. I wish you guys were in the room so I could go, yes, you. Um, let's think about this for a, se a second or two. So, if all propositions, sorry, if all meaningful propositions about the world have to be empirically verified or analytically verified, what might be the problem with the verification principle? You've got it right. It cannot be verified empirically, nor can it be uh, verified analytically. Right? It has to be viewed as almost a truth above all truth. They're saying in order to gain truth, we need to get X, Y and Z. And we're asking them, well, how do you know that's true? And this is the same criticism that's being leveled at eliminativism. Eliminativism is saying that things about the world um, that don't fully explain the world need to be eliminated. And that's a bad way of explaining it. Eliminativism is saying, sorry, this is a bit confusing. Eliminativism is saying that um, our beliefs that we have beliefs, sensations, desires, etc. is not true, right? And, and that as a concept needs to be eliminated. But then in order for me to talk as an eliminativist, I have to have beliefs, intentions and thoughts. And so the claim that's being made here is that, therefore, eliminativism can't be true, right? Because almost by definition, me talking as an eliminativist, I have to have thoughts, desires, and etc. I hope that makes some sense. Um, we're going to look at the next slide. This is the last slide, slide 12. If it is true that there are no such things as beliefs, then the proponent of eliminativism cannot really believe the theory to be true. Right. So in other words, the belief expects expressed by eliminativism in other words the belief expressed by eliminativism have no sense if it is true sorry guys um so we're now going to turn to page uh, 294 right and this is um, right before we get to functionalism which obviously we've done so don't worry about that um and we're going to look at a, at a defense right that, that churchland brings up and it's, it's a weird defense and i want to see what you guys think about it very good. Yeah, here we go. So he uses a weird analogy and we'll look at his argument. Then we'll look at the criticism of his argument and then we'll end this. And I hope this was useful for you guys. Please do tell me. So we're looking at 293. This is the last paragraph on 293. It starts with Paul Churchland. So Paul Churchland responds by pointing out that this objection presupposes the truth of folk psychology in order to claim that the proponent of eliminativism cannot be making sense. And he gives an analogous argument to show the circularity in the reasoning, right? He, again, he's trying to say that what this objection is, is presupposing is that our belief in folk psychology is, is accurate, right? And it's fair. 
In the 18th century, people believed in a substance called the vital spirit, which was supposed to animate living things and so distinguish them from inanimate objects like stones or clocks. Right, so the idea was that inside me and inside all of you as, as living beings was this thing called the vital spirit, which gave us vitality, right? It's where that sort of concept comes from. Um, so suppose someone who denied the existence of vital spirits were challenged by this following argument, which Paul Churchland believes is, is the same as what the self-refuting criticism is. So the anti-vitalist says there is no such thing as vital spirit. But this claim is self-refuting. For if the claim is true, then the speaker does not have vital spirit and must be dead. But if he is dead, then his statement is a meaningless string of noises devoid of meaning and truth. Let's read that one more time. So we're going to start from the beginning of that sentence. So suppose someone who denied the existence of vital spirit were challenged by the following argument. The anti-vitalist says there is no such thing as vital spirit. But this claim is self-refuting, for if the claim is true, then the speaker does not have a vital spirit and must be dead. But if he is dead, then his statement is a meaningless string of noises devoid of meaning and truth. So this defense of vitalism presupposes the existence of vital spirit in order to say that someone who denies its existence must be dead. So what's being pointed out here is that um, you believe in the vital spirit and I say to you that's nonsense, it's all just crap. And you say to me, ah, well, if you if vital spirit doesn't exist, then you're dead. And, and, and it's an insane argument because, again, it's presupposing the thing that I'm claiming simply doesn't exist. But those who reject vital spirits are giving an alternative account of what it is to be alive. In the same way, the denial that beliefs are real would involve an alternative account of humans' internal life and behavior. So what they're saying here, right, is that. When when the eliminativist claims uh, beliefs, sensations, desires, etc. don't exist, and I say, ah, ha, ha, but how do you have the belief that those things don't exist? They are saying that's not a belief, right? They're saying there is, in fact, something else which causes that or is that, you know, as an ontological distinction, um, which is not, in fact, explained or understood through folk psychology. So I'm just going to try and repeat that again, mainly for my own sake. So that's to say that... You're claiming a lim you're claiming that thoughts, desires, etc. do exist. And I'm claiming they don't. Okay, I say those things don't exist. I'm an eliminativist. And you say to me, ah, but the reason you know, your belief in the in the belief in eliminativism is proof that beliefs, etc. exist. Well, the eliminativist would say that's not actually a belief. Right. It, 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 it shouldn't be understood or ontologically reduced to a belief or a mental state because it is explained through something entirely different. Um, we're just going to look very quickly. I'm going to read through this final paragraph before it says functionalism. Again, this is on 294. Um, it says, however, we may not be impressed by this analogy since what eliminates what eliminativism denies is the very idea of meaning and of the notion that a belief could be true or false. So the status of eliminativists claim looks precarious. It seems we can make no sense of supposing them to be true or well evidenced. What would be needed for the analogy with vitalism to work would be some account of an alternative to intentional states, such as beliefs in which to frame the theory. But without this, we can't even make sense of the claim that folk psychology is false, since making sense of the claim involves presupposing that it is true. Now, this final one is that that final paragraph is quite tricky. Um, so what I'll say is uh, what I'll say is that whilst you guys are looking through stuff, right, like revising, if you will, um, have a look at that argument, right? Because the self-refuting argument is important and, and a useful one. It's not the strongest one, but it's a useful one. And understanding the problem with the defense is very, very useful. And I'd say very interesting because it's a very weird form of circular argument. Okay. Um, so what did we get? 40 minutes. It's not bad. Um, what was I going to say? So, yeah, well, this was this was our first, um, you know, online lesson. Um, 
again, I'd very, very much appreciate, and I know I'm constantly asking you guys for this, but I'd very much appreciate some feedback. You know, tell me what you think about this. Did it work? Um, did it, did it, did I move too quickly? You know, did it explain the things properly, etc., etc. Um, obviously, I don't have the presentation, you know, in front of me in terms of for you guys. I can see it on my computer, but you can't see it, and I don't know whether that impede you guys so do try and watch this while you are looking at the presentation it'll be much more useful i think much easier to follow um what else also i guess this is the final thing so you guys have received emails from both now pete and nigel about your um is that somewhere um about your, pr your grades and predictive grades and all of that Unfortunately for you guys, I really just don't know anything more than is being told to you through these emails. You know, I'm being as informed as you are as we go. Um, the essay I've handed you, given you guys already for this Friday, you know, like I said in, in the in the note, it's not your final assessed piece. And, you know, in the next few weeks, there will be other essays. So don't stress too much about it. But at the same time, as I mentioned, it you know, don't take it too lightly it is important and it is worth doing well and it is worth spending time on and note that it will be part of how your predictive grades are calculated and understood you know um the school and the government will not just leave you guys hanging in terms of your last grade especially maybe if your mocks weren't very good um so don't stress too much it's not like there's nothing more you can do to add to your grade or improve it but but, you know, be aware, just just be cognizant of how this is moving. Uh, and unfortunately, that's kind of all I can give you guys. And I am sorry to leave you guys hanging. I, I really, really, really can't feel for you guys enough. It's just the worst. Um, yeah, that's that's that. I hope that's useful. I hope I can upload this on Classroom. I'm sure I'll be able to. Um, I mean, that's the last piece of content that we have properly, except for Epiphenomenalism, which actually I might do in the next couple of days. Um, yeah, I hope this is useful. Um, take care guys. Keep, keep, keep well, keep sane, keep happy and, uh, keep in contact. If you need anything at all, uh, please let me know. I'm speaking to a couple of you about, um, essay sort of help and, 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 you know, either one-on-one -on -one or group sessions. I don't know how you guys want to do that. Let me know. You know, we'll keep in contact and we'll figure that out. But I hope this is helpful. Take care guys.